Now, this man, David, is a very remarkable man, and this next chapter, chapter 25, reveals it. We have here, actually, the death of Samuel in his retirement, and then we find that David encounters Nabal and Abigail. And David was right on the verge here of committing a very rash act. And a very wonderful woman by the name of Abigail prevented him from doing it. This is one of the high points in the life of David. Now, before we get to that, let me read the first verse of chapter 25 of 1 Samuel. And Samuel died, and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in his house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. David now is actually moving farther away because he knows that Samuel was actually a force for good. He was a deterrent that was preventing the bitterness and the hatred of Saul to be vented upon him. And he knew that the minute that Samuel died, that he was a sort of a buffer between him and King Saul, and that now Saul would make every effort to try to destroy him. So he goes way down into the wilderness. By the way, he gets farther away than Elijah ever did from Jezebel. Now, we have this incident, though, of David and Nabal. I probably should have a eulogy here for Samuel, but Scripture's very brief here at his death. All it does, it says, "...all Israel gathered together and lamented and wept." Samuel had been a great man of God, no question about that. Outstanding, and he was the bridge between the judges and the king. He was actually the last of the judges and the first of the, shall I say, professional prophets or the office of prophet. There had been many prophets before Samuel, but he represents now an office that will follow through all the way through the Old Testament and into the New Testament, by the way. Now, we have before us here a man. Well, I think maybe we better let the Word of God tell us all about him. I begin reading now at verse 2 of First Samuel 25. And there was a man and man whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and a 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding, and of a beautiful countenance, but the man was curlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. Now, not all of Caleb's offspring turned out well, as you can see from this man here. It was Emerson, by the way, who said to be great is to be misunderstood, and certainly this applies to David. As we've said, he was great and he was misunderstood. The world does not know David, and therefore it misjudges him. When the name of David is mentioned, immediately, why, there is called to mind his heinous sin. And there are those that inquire, how could David commit such a sin, and how could God say he's a man after God's own heart? And we'll have an occasion to answer those questions. But instead of questioning God's choice... We ought to investigate David's character, really. And you will find that only those that are small and little will be the critics of this man. I think that David is one of the most lovely characters in Scripture. And to know David is to love him. I know of no man who presents such nobility of character as he does. Now, he had a checkered career. He was born a peasant boy in Bethlehem of Jesse of the tribe of Judah. He was brought up a little shepherd boy among fine brothers older than he was. He was passed by, but God hadn't passed him by. God knew his heart, 
And God doesn't look on the outward side. God knew this boy's heart. He was anointed king by Samuel, and he slew Goliath the giant. He was a musician. He's called the sweet psalmist of Israel. And he penned the most beautiful poetry written in any language or sung in any tongue. And if you doubt that, have you anything to put down beside the 23rd Psalm? And this man, David, married a princess, Micah, daughter of Saul. He was loved by Jonathan, the son of Saul. Never did a man have a friend like Jonathan. And David had such a friend. And he became an outlaw, a sort of a Garibaldi. And during that time, he gathered to himself a band of men, and they lived in the mountain strongholds. He played mad like Hamlet on one occasion. He became finally king of Judah, then of Israel. And we're going to see his own son led a rebellion against him, and he was forced to flee. And he lived to see Solomon, his son, anointed king. Now, instead of looking at David and Bathsheba and seeing David's sin, I want you to look at something else, and not at David and Goliath and seeing his heroic accomplishment, or David and Jonathan and analyzing friendship. This chapter here has a very simple story, but it's a story of life, and it reveals the inmost recesses of his soul, of this man David. It's the story of David and Abigail, and it reveals how human this man David really was. Now, the name Nabal means fool. And how in the world the man got that name, I don't know, but he sure lived up to his name. But after all, aren't we all born fools? The Scripture says man is born like the wild ass's colt. Foolishness is bound up in our hearts. You want to look at your own life for a few moments? Did you ever do anything foolish? I think all of us have. And we'd rather not think about those things, would we? Well, Nabal was a fool, but he was a rich man. He had no honor or honesty. He was a drunken beast, and he was a cabite. That is, he is a dog. But he had a beautiful wife, an intelligent woman, And that's a rare combination, but it's a pleasing one. And the question is, how did this man get such a jewel for a wife? Dr. McConkie calls the story of Nabal and Abigail beauty and the beast. And I think, frankly, that her parents had made the match. They were impressed by the man's wealth. And here's a case of beauty was sold for gold and Here's a traffic in a human soul. Somebody says, that's terrible. Happens all the time in our contemporary culture. But how often this has happened today, we actually don't know. But a sordid story we have here, and this is what happened. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did share his sheep. That's verse 4. And David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And what happened, and I'll tell this part of the story, David was protecting this man. You see, David had quite an army with him, and he could have robbed this man of his sheep. He could have taken them, but he didn't. He protected them and kept the thieves and marauders from getting them. And he did many things to assist this man. And now David needs food. And so he sends his young man to this man to ask for help. And we read in verse 9, And when David's young man came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David, and ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who's David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. And, of course, what he's doing is saying that David has betrayed this man Saul and that he is disloyal. And then listen to Nabal in verse 11. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I've killed for my shearers and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? 
So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all those sayings. David said unto his men, You know, David, I told you at the beginning he was red-headed. He's hot-headed. He's angry now. He says, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And there went up David about 400 men and 200 abode by the staff. And one of the young men told Abigail and Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master. And she knew what he's going to do. So she got together a great deal of food stuff. We're told in verse 18, Then Abigail made haste, took 200 loaves and sheep, and ready dressed all of that, and raisins, and cakes of figs, and she goes out now to meet David before he gets to Nabal, because David would have killed him. Now will you notice verse 21? Now David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good." So and more also do God unto the enemies of David, if I leave all that pertain to him. Well, I'm not going to read the rest of it. You can read it, but you're going to find out he's going to kill every man that is among this man, Nabal. And Abigail went to meet David, and she lighted off of her ass and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground fell at his feet and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. says, Take your vengeance out on me. And David's not about to do that. She's a beautiful woman to begin with. And these two confront each other. And she's an outstanding, noble woman. And she says that my Lord shouldn't have done that. And then she says concerning David, You are God's man. And I want to tell you, friends, David begins to see things a little differently. And he doesn't carry out a vengeance that he should never have carried out. Now she appeals to the best that's in David, and she advises him. Listen to her, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 25. She apologizes for the fact her husband is a fool and a brute. Listen to this. Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, that he's a man of the devil, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young man of my Lord, whom thou didst send. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand. Now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. And now this blessing which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, For the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord. And evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. David is just starting out, friends. Evil is in his life later on, but up to this point, David is as clean as a hound's tooth. He's lived for God, and he's attempting to please God. And this woman admires him for it. Now, notice verse 29. This is one of the most remarkable things said about David. Be wonderful if it could be said about us. He says, Yet a man is risen to pursue thee and to seek thy soul. She's referring now to King Saul. She doesn't identify him by name. I read on. But the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. Now, I think that's one of the most wonderful statements ever made concerning David, made by this woman. And she says, Your soul is bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. And friends, that's just exactly the position 
of the believer today in Christ. You know, John in his first epistle calls him eternal life. He says, we have seen eternal life. And he means the Lord Jesus. He is eternal life. And when you and I trust him as Savior, the Holy Spirit baptizes us into the body of believers. And that body is Christ. Paul says, by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. And you and I today are brought into the body of believers, the body of Christ, by faith in Christ. And we are said to be in Christ. And there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ. And so we are bound in the bundle of life with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this woman, Abigail, said that of David, that you're bound in the bundle of life with God. And now she continues in verse 29, And the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out, as out of the middle of a sling. Just like you take a slingshot, and David knew all about that. And I think that she referred to that purposely, because it was well known now in Israel what David had done with the slingshot in slaying Goliath. And she says, just as you put that rock in that slingshot and you threw it out of the sling and it hit Goliath, that's the way your enemies will be thrown out. They shall be sling out, as she puts it here. He'll sling them out. What a picture that you have here. Now she continues... And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he hath spoken concerning thee and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel that this shall be no grief unto thee nor offense of heart unto my Lord either that thou hast shed blood causeless or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord then remember thine handmaid. What she's saying is, don't hold this against us. You're going to be king. And notice what David does now. I can see him sitting astride that horse. He's looking down at this woman that's right actually down in the dust. She's a beautiful woman, and she's a noble woman, a wonderful character. And David looks down at her, and this is what he says. Verse 32, And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me, and blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou which hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood, and from avenging myself with mine own hand. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, except thou hast hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal, not a man. He said, I'd have killed them all. And David received of her hand that which she brought. And he said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I've hearkened to thy voice and have accepted thy person. And Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in the house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore, she told him nothing less or more until the morning light. But it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal, And his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. You see, this man, he had a big night. He was a swinger, but he sobered up the next morning. And it's the morning after the night before, and he's really got a headache and a heartache too. That heart becomes a stone. And it came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal, and he died. He had a heart attack, friends. You see, it's well that God intervened, because David would have been read with murder, and God didn't want it that way, and Abigail didn't want it that way. Now what's he going to do? There's a beautiful widow that lives 
in the desert of Paran. What do you think David's going to do now? She's the only woman that ever did him well, I would say, that was a blessing to him. Now notice verse 39, And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord. And actually there's a little personal feeling in this. That hath pleased the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. You know, she said when she came to David, says, don't forget us, says, remember thine handmaid. And David couldn't forget her. You know why? Well, she had appealed to the best in him, and she advised him, and he knew that advice was right, and he knew that he loved her. I think it was love at first sight. And now David recognizes the hand of God. And God can use beauty, and he thanks her for advice. And now we find that when they stood there that day, there were two great souls that stood in the presence of each other. And now that this man's dead, why, what happens? Why, he goes down and he asks her to become his wife. And you know what happened? She did. And so this is the beginning now of the life of David as a rugged soldier. This marks it, by the way. And now something else takes place. God didn't approve of it. This is not the reason that he's a man after God's own heart. But we're told here that David, verse 43, also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they were also both of them his wives. But Saul had given Michael, his daughter David's wife, to foul tithe son of Lish, which was of Galim. And this is the beginning of a life of David. It was a life of sin. It entered into his life, friends. He was a rugged man. And it was a life that later on a murder. And when we get to it, I think I can offer an explanation. I'm sure that's satisfactory, but It didn't keep David from being a sinner that he was. And somebody says, well, how could David say he's a man after my own heart? Well, let's understand one thing. God said to David, you can't do the thing that you really want to do, and that is build a temple. God would not permit him to do that. And that was the thing upon David's heart that he wanted to do above all else, but God wouldn't permit him to do that. And then when David sinned, God did put the lash on his back and never took it off his back. Now we come to the 26th chapter, and when we do, we see David again spare Saul in the wilderness of Ziph. And we'll notice here the contrast between Saul and David. Saul knows now that David is God's choice. But in spite of all that, he seeks to slay him. And David recognized that Saul is still the anointed king, and he spares him. And God must deal with Saul, and he's going to, and he will. We're going to see that. Now, we'll notice this as we move on. I begin reading now in chapter 26. And the Ziphites came unto Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself in the hill of Hakalah, which is before Jeshimon? Then Saul rose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having three thousand chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. Now here goes Saul on another campaign another crusade to try to destroy David. Now we find that what happens is this. David was in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. Now, David knew that wilderness, and Saul did not. David knew his way around. And it's well to note that from here on, David is a great military man. He knew the terrain of that land that made him an expert general. And he also had loyal men with him that were willing to die for him and with him. And that made a great deal of difference. Saul did not know the terrain. 
and added to that, his followers were not as loyal as they could be, and he certainly suspected them. Now we are told that, verse 4, David therefore sent out spies and understood that Saul was come in very deed. David couldn't believe that Saul would make such a military blunder as that, so he sent spies out, and they came back, these scouts, and reported that Saul actually was in the wilderness there. Now we're told, and David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched. And David beheld the place where Saul lay. And Abner, the son of Ner, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench, and the people pitched round about him. Now David is in a position to observe all of this. He was able to hide in that wilderness. Now David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched. And he beheld the place where Saul lay. And Abner, the son of Ner, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench, and the people pitched round about him. Then answered David and said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Abishai the son of Zeruah, brother of Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? And Abishai said, I'll go down with thee. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and beheld Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay round about him. You see, at the head of the bed, why, he just stuck his spear in the ground. And what happened? Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray. The, with the spear, even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. The thing that Abishai says, if you just let me at him, I'll just take one blow. That's all I'll need, and I'll rid you of your enemy. And David said to Abishai, destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? You see now, he refuses here to do this thing. And David again has the opportunity to slay Saul and will not avail himself of it. David said, Furthermore, as the Lord liveth, and the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. He says, God will have to take care of him. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. And David is acting upon that principle. Verse 11, The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of water, and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they got them away. And no man saw it, nor knew it, neither awake, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. Well, it wasn't difficult, I would say, because I do not think the protectors of Saul were too loyal to him. Uh, I think they were glad to get a little nap here. Verse 13, Then David went over to the other side and stood on the top of the hill afar off a great space, being between them. Now, David withdrew, but not to his man. He went around way over on the other side, and he got a safe distance where he could have gotten away. And David cried to the people, and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Answerest thou not, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, Who art thou that criest to the king? Now, very frankly, David, I think, is being very sarcastic here with Abner, who was the captain for Saul and should have been protecting him. And David said to Abner, Art not thou a valiant man? And who is like to thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept thy lord the king? For there came one of the people in to destroy the king thy lord. The thing's not good that thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, you are worthy to die because you have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. 
And now, see where the king's spear is in the cruise of water that was at his bolster? And Saul knew David's voice and said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And David said, It's my voice, my lord, O king. And what actually happened here, as you can see, is that David is ridiculing Abner, the captain. And he says, Why, the king could have been destroyed. He could have been slain. And they begin to look around at each other, and the king wakes up, and he was wondering what's happened. He says, look there and see where the spear is and the cruise of water. It's gone. And I think David held it up. And David said, look, I've got it. I could have slain him, but I did not. That's the important thing again. He did not slay the king. And what a wonderful attitude this was, you see. God is going to handle it as far as David is concerned. It's easy to criticize David, is it not, friends? But how many of us today are letting God handle our enemies? We're trying to take the thing in our own hands, and we're trying to answer them and trying to deal with them. God says, let me handle it, and you walk by faith. Trust me. God says, you can trust me. And you're going to find out David could trust the Lord because the Lord will take care of Saul in time. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt both do great things and also shalt still prevail. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. Now we find here that David is becoming very much discouraged in this constantly running away. Now, if you'll notice here in chapter 27, we find that David's heart is becoming weary with this continual running away and hiding in the dens of the earth. This chapter opens with, And David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day, by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me than I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines, and Saul shall despair of me to seek me any more in any coast of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. Now, this obviously is a departure of David from that high plane of faith in God that he manifests in his life. This is a period of just letting down. We find that this same thing happened to Abraham. It happened to Isaac. It happened to Jacob. The fact of the matter is, it seems to have come in the lives of most of God's men. And it has a real message for you and me today. I'm sure that we're speaking today to some weary soul. You are faced with problems. You've been in the darkness maybe a long time. You've been down in the valley, and you're just wondering if you'll ever come through or not. And you, like David, you despair, actually, that there'll ever be a solution to your problem. And you go through that period. Well, if it's any comfort, There are others that have been down through the same valley as you've been and over the same route. It's a well-worn route. And here is a man that took that route long before you and I got here. And I'm sure most of us have been over it. It's one of the reasons David has been such a help to me in my own Christian life is because of an experience that he has like this. And you can certainly sympathize with him. It looks like the poor man may spend the rest of his life. And he's had several narrow escapes. And one of these days, he could be slain. And he's wondering about it all. And I'm sure that today, there are those that despair and feel like giving up. Well, what happened was, and I'm not going into detail here other than to just read verse 2, where it says, And David arose and passed over with the 600 men that were with him unto Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. And he dwelt in Gath here, 
man, he took these two wives. We're going to have occasion to talk about this in the life of David later on. But let me just pass by it at this time and say, this man, discouraged, despondent, and down, he does something he should not have done. He leaves the land and goes into the land of the Philistines, and it actually, as we're going to see, gets him into trouble. And we find him now among the enemies of God. Here in chapter 28, it says, It came to pass in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. And Achish said unto David, Know thou assuredly that thou shalt go out with me to battle, thou and thy man. And David said to Achish, Surely thou shalt know that thy servant can do. And he says that I'll make thee the keeper of mine head forever. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. And the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. Now we have the visit of Saul to the witch of Endor. I'm reading verse 5. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Now, God is not speaking to this man at all. Let's put this down at this particular point. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and diligently inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. And Endor means ventriloquist. She was a ventriloquist. And I think that she was partly a phony and partly given over to spiritism. Now, let me dwell on this for just a moment. You and I are living in a day of frills and thrills in religion. And one of the avenues which thrill-seekers are exploring is modern spiritism, or ancient necromancy. And, of course, the strongest argument they have is the witch of Endor. They say, well, she brought up Samuel. And the question is, did Samuel come back from the dead to communicate with Saul? If so, of course, it's the only instance recorded in Scripture now, before answering this question, I want you to look at some material that's in the background here that's important for us to see. Scripture positively condemns the practice of necromancy. In Deuteronomy 18, verse 9, "...when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations." There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord." And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto the observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. Now, you and I are living in a day when we find that there's a great deal of practice in this connection. Out in Hollywood, there are two that were listed several years ago in Time magazine. These two necromancers are fortune tellers, 
and most of the Hollywood stars consulted them according to the article in Time magazine. May I say to you that right now we're seeing a revival of that, and it's been going on a long time. Back in 1947, The Guardian, a publication of the Church of England, had this article. It says, in spite of the large amount of fraud, fake, deceit, and thought reading, conscious or unconscious, that the investigator of psychic research has to contend with, there remains a nucleus of genuine matter that cannot be explained with our present knowledge except by accepting the hypothesis that human personalities exist through death and that certain persons have the power and gift of contacting them. Churches have nothing to fear from genuine psychic phenomena. May I say to you, that is amazing, because since then there has been growing this matter of looking at the stars. There has been growing this so-called science of ESP. And I can't go into a great deal of detail in a study like this, but a great many people today are studying the stars. They go and buy a horoscope. And literally millions of dollars today are being spent. And according to that article that was in Time magazine several years ago, probably the astrologers are taking in several million dollars a year. And that there are some 5,000 full-time astrologers and about 100,000 part-timers who collect an estimated $100 million a year from more than 10 million believers, and most of them are female. That's what the article says. Now, may I say to you that the Word of God absolutely condemns this sort of thing, and God has judged nations in the past because of it. And he even put his own people out of the land from turning from him to these different ones. My friend, this is one of the dangerous practices of the hour. Scripture warns of this practice and predicts that there'd be an outbreak of it, by the way. You find in the account of Lazarus, the beggar and the rich man, the rich man was strictly forbidden to return to the living. He's told he couldn't. Paul was caught up to heaven and silenced. He couldn't even tell what he had seen at all. And listen to what the Word of God says. Matthew 24, 24 says, For there shall arise false Christ, false prophets. They'll show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And Paul in Second Thessalonians says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all powers and signs and lying wonders. And Paul writing to a young preacher says in First Timothy 4, 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And we have on the West Coast several churches, they call them churches, where they're called Satan churches. They worship Satan actually. And this is something the Word of God says will increase in the last days. And this is something that this man, Saul, now is going to this witch of Endor. Now will you notice, Saul disguised himself, and I'm reading verse 8, put on other raiment, he went and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest that Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land, wherefore layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die." And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid. For what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? 
And she said, An old man cometh up, and he's covered with a mantle. Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is departed from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me that I shall do." Well, friends, it's obvious from this that God's not in this. God would not call him up to begin with, but Saul makes it clear God was no longer speaking to him at all. Now, in Scripture, we need to understand that only Christ ever communicated with the dead. You will recognize that he spoke, and he alone can speak to the dead. And this man Saul was abandoned of God. Heaven is silent, and so Saul turns to hell. Now, did Samuel appear to Saul? There have been several explanations that have been offered. There are those that dismiss this as a fraud, that the entire incident, that nothing was genuine. She was a ventriloquist. She could have put on all of this, but I think she was as frightened as Saul was at what happened. I think she was a fraud. Houdini, in his day, said he could duplicate 95% of so-called supernatural things that spiritualism said they could do and did do, and Houdini could duplicate it. Now, granted that 99 and 44 one-hundredths percent is fraud, what about the rest? I believe that what happened here is supernatural, but I don't think God had a thing to do with it. Now, there's been another explanation that has been forthcoming, and that explanation, of course, is that the very desire of loved ones to want to communicate with those that have gone before. Now, I think that explains Sir Oliver Lodge and Sir Conan Doyle. They both had sons, you know, that were lost in the war, and they wanted to see them. And I believe even these men were taken in by it. And a great many are taken in that way today because they want to see. And when you want to see something, it's not very difficult to make you see it. Kipling wrote a poem that I think is the answer to this. Listen to this. The road to Endor is easy to tread for mother or yearning wife. There it is sure we shall meet our dead as they were even in life. Earth has not dreamed of the blessing in store for desolate hearts on the road to Endor. Whispers shall comfort us out of the dark, hands, ah, God, that we knew. Visions and voices, look and heart, shall prove that our tale is true, and that those who have passed to the further shore may be hailed at a price on the road to Endor. Oh, the road to Endor is the oldest road and the craziest road of all. Straight it runs to the witch's abode, as it did in the days of Saul. And nothing has changed of the sorrow in store for such as go down to the road to Endor. And so there is another explanation. Now there are those that say that the witch actually brought Samuel from the dead. I say to you that's not tenable are consistent with the rest of Scripture. We read here, Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me? Saul answered, I'm sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me. He wanted an answer, you see. And he said God was not answering him. And actually, this was a familiar spirit. The ventriloquist, I think she was a fraud, but she was controlled and mastered by a divining demon. And really, she gave no new news. If you notice here, nothing new was advanced at this time. He'd already been told that God had rejected him. And already in 1 Samuel 15, 23, Samuel had said in his lifetime, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, hath also rejected thee from being king. Well, God's already told him that. This was nothing new. 
The thing is that when this spirit here says, The Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David, that's not new at all. That was already known. And you have no new word at all. And we're told here in First Chronicles 10, verse 13, it says, So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it, and inquired not of the Lord. Therefore he slew him, and turned the kingdom unto David the son of Jesse." May I say to you, God condemned this thing that he did and gave that as one of the explanations. And if you go over to the book of Job, you find that another man there, he came up with something. He was one of the friends of Job. And he says, Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and mine ear received a little thereof, in thoughts from the vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth on men. Fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before mine eyes. There was silence, and I heard a voice. And what in the world do you think is going to be said? When this man went through all of these gyrations and had this tremendous experience, what came out? Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Nothing new. The Spirit revealed nothing new. fact of the matter is, what actually happened, I think, is this. An explanation that's helped by many able expositors of the word, God, not the witch, made Samuel appear. And, of course, they use verse 12, that actually it was God that did it. But I do not hold that. A false spirit appeared, and it was not Samuel. God no longer spoke to Saul. Worse still, Saul no longer spoke to God. And the dead cannot communicate with the living at all. And therefore, this was satanic from beginning to end, and nothing new was said at all. Now, our study today brings us to the 29th chapter of the book of First Samuel. And if you have your Bible, and we'll turn there, and if you have our notes. Now, in this particular section, we do not have any extended notes because of the fact that we have felt that this section is one that we did not need to develop as it more or less tells its own story. We are following now the story of David and Saul, and very shortly the story of Saul is coming to an end. We saw last time that David became very much discouraged and despondent, and he wanted to, as it were, throw in the towel, and he left the land. God never told him to leave any more than he told Abraham to leave. But again, on Abraham's part, it was a lapse of faith, and on the part of David, it's a lapse of faith. So he stepped out of the land and actually moved over into the country of Philistia, which definitely was the enemy's of his people. And so he went over there and spent some time there and became a very good friend of the king. Now, what happened was that war broke out again between the Philistines and the Israelites. And David found himself in a very awkward spot. But he felt obligated to stay with these folk that he had been with That is, Achish, the king of the Philistines, at least one of the chiefs of the Philistines, was one that David was now a friend with, and he had befriended David. David had befriended him, and David felt that he should be his ally. But God intervened and prevented David from attacking his own people. And this, may I say, was a narrow escape for him, and had not God intervened, David would have done something he would have regretted the rest of his life. You know, Christian friend, today, you and I do not realize how many times 
God intervenes in our lives. You and I sometimes step over the boundary of where God wants us to be or what he wants us to do. And we make what the young people label today a boo-boo. And when we make a boo-boo, why, God intervenes many times to keep us from absolutely and probably committing a terrible sin that we would regret the rest of our lives. I'm sure that many of you can look back upon your lives and you can record and register many such effects and affairs as that in your life. Now, we find here, and I begin reading now at verse 1 of chapter 29. Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek, and the Israelites pitched by a fountain which is in Jezreel. And the lords of the Philistines passed on by hundreds and by thousands. But David and his men passed on in the rear with Achish. David was there with him. Now, these other lords of the Philistines saw David. They knew who he was. They didn't want him with them. And I think rightly so. I'm sure that if you saw a person who'd been your enemy, and all of a sudden he seems to be on your side, you want to make sure that he's not going to come up from the rear and attack you. That sometimes happens even among Christian brethren today. Sometimes some person that you have felt was not friendly to you, and all of a sudden he becomes friendly, and you wonder whether he's really your friend or not, or whether he has some ulterior motive in mind. And we read here in verse 3, Then said the princess of the Philistines, What do these Hebrews hear? And Achish said unto the princess of the Philistines, Is not this David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, which hath been with me these days, or these years? And I found no fault in him, since he fell unto me unto this day. Now, this man that David had been with, a Philistine, this man could find no fault with him. For the very simple reason, David had been a loyal follower. He'd never tempted to undermine him. David was not that kind of a man. I think today one of the tragedies in our Christian circles are men who attempt to undermine other Christians. And there's a great deal of that, of course, going on even in our day. Now we read here, the princes of the Philistines were wroth with him. And the princes of the Philistines said unto him, Make this fellow return, that he may go again to his place, which thou hast appointed him, And let him not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he be an adversary to us. For wherewith should he reconcile himself unto his master? Should it not be with the heads of these men? Now, these men reasoned like this, and there was a certain amount of logic in it. It may be that David wants to make a truce or a peace with King Saul. And how better could he do it if he turned on us and took some of us as prisoners or actually killed us, and that would reconcile him to Saul. And we don't want it that way. Now, i be very frank with you. Since these men did not know David, you cannot blame them for the position that they are taking. Is not this David of whom they sang one to another in dances, saying Saul slew his thousands, and David his ten thousands. Now, that is the position of these men. I think it's a reasonable, logical position. Now, notice, Achish, who had full confidence in David now, then Achish called David, said unto him, Surely, as the Lord liveth, thou hast been upright, and thy going out and thy coming in with me in the host is good in my sight. For I have not found evil in thee since the day of thy coming unto me unto this day. Nevertheless, the Lord's favor thee not. Wherefore now return and go in peace, that thou displease not the Lord's of the Philistines. In other words, Achish, one of the leaders, said, I'm outvoted. I'm outnumbered. The others will not have you. I have full confidence in you. 
But in order that we can have harmony in our midst, I'll have to ask you to return. And this, my friend, was nothing but the providence of Almighty God. It delivered David from fighting his own people. Now, and David said unto Achish, But what have I done? What hast thou found in thy servant so long as I have been with thee unto this day that I may not go fight against the enemies of my lord the king? And after all, King Saul was David's enemy at this time also. And David felt that he was perfectly right in doing this thing. But when you get a proper perspective of it, you can see by David's lapse of faith, stepping out of the land, which meant he stepped out of the will of God, it opened up the way for sin. The very interesting thing is, Christian friend, there are those that are saying today that a child of God, when he steps out of the will of God, loses his salvation. Well, you won't lose your salvation, but you're going to gain something you wish you didn't have. A man said to me in California years ago, he came in to see me. It was after World War II. He said, you know, I came out as a young man here in the service. I got out of the will of God. While I was out of the will of God, I married an unsaved girl. And he said, I have lived in a living hell from that day to the present hour. And he said, I see nothing to do but to step out and to get a divorce. And I told him, I said, don't you get a divorce. Let her get it if she wants to leave you. You stick it out, brother. This is what came to you when you were out of the will of God. You see, the child of God won't lose his salvation, but he's sure going to get something he wish he didn't have. And this fella had done that same thing, you see. You get in trouble, always, out of the will of God. Now, that is what has happened here to David. He's stepped out of the will of God, and he's about to commit an awful sin. But God intervenes, and we read here, verse 11, So David and his men rose up early to depart in the morning to return into the land of the Philistines, and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Now, Jezreel is up in the north. If you have a good map, you ought to take a look at the geography at this point, and it will open up, I think, a great deal of what is happening here and make it understandable. Jezreel is up near the valley of Esdraelon, by the way. In fact, I would say part of it, because that's a tremendous battlefield as it's going to be someday. It's a wonderful, fertile valley today and is being used. But you find that David did not go up to Jezreel, but at this time the Philistines did. Now, while they were gone, another enemy from the south, the Amalekites, invaded the Philistine country and the place that David had made his home while he was out of the land, which was Ziklag. Now, if you get your map, you'll find out Ziklag is way down in the south, even south of Beersheba. It's down in the Philistine country. And while they were gone from there, the army, why the Amalekites had invaded. And this is what happened, and we have that now in chapter 30. It came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag, and smitten Ziklag, and burned it with fire. Now, what else had they done? And had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, neither great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, their daughters were taken captive. Now, you can appreciate now the position of David and his men. They have returned back to the city that they'd made their own. And David has with him now, as you know, over 600 followers, each one of them married, each one of them with a wife, each one of them with children. You can imagine that it was quite a place. Now it's been destroyed, been burned with fire. And these men are distraught. They've lost their wives and their children. 
And as far as they know, they've been slain. Now, will you notice verse 4? Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no power to weep. This was a great blow and a sorrow to David. Now, will you notice what had happened? And David's two wives were taken captives. Ahanoam, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. You remember that Abigail was married to this very rich man, and his name Nabal means fool. Or I guess that she probably called him stupid. I don't know. That would be a good name for him. But he had had a heart attack and died, and David had taken her to wife. She was the good part of David's life, the only bright spot that I can find in David's life, and actually the only woman that did him good that was a blessing to him. Now, David was greatly distressed, not only because he lost his loved ones, but for the people spake of stoning him. They blamed David, he was the leader, for leaving Ziklag and going with the Philistines. David, you see, made a blunder. It was a great blunder on his part. Now, we like to think of David, the shepherd boy. David, he's the one that slew Goliath. Then we like to turn over to the black side and look at his great sin that he committed. But we don't realize that David was very much of a human being, like the rest of us, and he blundered a great deal. This was a blunder on his part, and the people are about ready to stone him, his man are, because the soul of all the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. To me, that's interesting. They're grieving for their children, but they don't seem to be grieving for their wives. You know why? They think they've been slain. They think probably the children have been kept alive, but that their wives are slain. Now, David is between, as the common colloquialism has it, he's between a rock and a hard place. He's between the devil and the deep blue sea. He's in a bad spot. He's lost his loved ones, his own followers. Now, under this great emotional strain of having lost their loved ones, they want now to stone David. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. I think this is one of the most wonderful statements that is made, and I just hang on to that verse for just a few moments, or this portion of the verse. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Friends, there are times in our lives that the circumstances will not produce any joy or any happiness in our lives. There are times that you and I are in a dark place, like David was. You look about you, and it looks helpless and hopeless. And what are you going to do? Be discouraged? Throw in the sponge? Give up? Say that you're through? My friend, if you're a child of God, you'll encourage yourself in the Lord. Turn to him at a time like that. And sometimes the Lord puts us in a spot like that, so we will turn to him. And it's in a time like that that he'll make himself real to us. And it is at a time like this that David wrote some of his psalms, by the way. It is a time like this that Psalm 23 would be very meaningful. It's at a time like this that you can just thumb your way through the book of Psalms and you can find many of them where David is encouraging himself in the Lord. The Lord is good. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And David found that to be true. I think this is a very wonderful portion. Now, we find here in verse 7, And David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought hither the ephod to David. Now, this was a portion of the great high priest's garments that speaks of prayer. You'll recall that this was a garment that went over the garment that he wore that when he was just like any other priest. This set him aside 
And it was the garment he wore when he went in to the golden altar of prayer. And he had two stones, one on each shoulder, and he had on that the names of the tribes of Israel, six on one shoulder, six on the other. In other words, he carried them on his shoulder. Now, this is a picture of Christ, our great high priest, who carries us on his shoulder. You remember that little sheep that got lost? What did the shepherd do? He put him on his shoulder and brought him back. And I do not know who you are, where you are, how you are, or why you are, friends, but I do know this, that he today is prepared to come and get you, put you on his shoulder, and he's able to save to the uttermost those who come unto God through him. And so David gets this garment that speaks of prayer, and he goes to God in prayer. At a time like this, the one today, our great high priest up yonder, the one who is our shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd. And he's the one that David is appealing to at a time like this. And now he makes inquiry. He asks of the Lord. He said this, verse 8, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. God now encourages him to go. And that's exactly what he does. And David, verse 10, pursued he and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the brook Besor. Now, You see, when he got back, all the provisions had been taken. And these men are absolutely faint. Two hundred of them could not make the trip because they had marched double time getting back here, you see. Now, what happens is this, verse 10, but David pursued he and 400 men. And what happened? Well, they found an Egyptian in the field, brought him to David, and gave him bread, and he did eat, and they made him drink water. They gave him a piece of cake of figs. Now, this fellow had taken sick, and he tells David that he was a servant of one of the Amalekite leaders, and that when he got sick, they just left him, left him to die. And now David has overtaken this man. He's yet to overcome the enemy, and he wants to know where they are. And so this Egyptian tells him where the Amalekites have gone. And so he explains what had happened at the burning of Ziklag. Now the servant says, I tell you on condition that you won't return me to my master. And David says, I can assure you one thing, you're not going to be sent back to your master. Now what happened is David made a surprise attack then upon them, and he found them. In revelry, they were enjoying the victory and the spoils they had taken. Verse 16, when he brought him down, behold, they were spread abroad upon all the earth, eating and drinking and dancing because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. And David smote them from the twilight even unto the evening of the next day, and there escaped not a man of them save 400 young men which rode upon camels and fled. And these fellows, they had a little transportation, and they were able to get away. Now David took all the flocks, the herds, which they had taken, and then returned also the wives and the children, the ones they belonged to. Now there was an argument among David's men whether the 200 men should share in the spoil or not. And David puts down a great principle here that reveals his fairness and of his justice, which made him the kind of a man God could use. He said, these 200 men that were sick, that couldn't come with us, they weren't able to make the trip, they're going to share equally in the booty. And I want to say that that revealed justice on the part of David. Now, friends, we come to this last chapter of 1 Samuel, And we're going to look at the question of who killed King Saul. And here is a case where probably we ought to turn it over to the FBI because there seems to be some question here as who is responsible for his death. Now, will you notice, I begin reading at verse 1. 
the Israelites are in battle with the Philistines. And thank the Lord, David was not engaged in that battle. The providence of God, God intervened to keep him from entering that battle. And so David had withdrawn, gone back to Ziklag, found the tragedy that had taken place there, and he'd gone after the Amalekites who had destroyed and burned the city and taken the people captive. Now we find that in verse 1, the Philistines fought against Israel. And the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And every time that you find the Israelites fleeing before their enemies, it's because they're out of the will of God, because they're going against God. Now, this idea today that God approved a war in the Old Testament, he did not at all. And when Israel would engage in a war outside of the will of God, when they're not defending themselves, then they generally lost the battle. And that's what happened here. Now we're told in verse 2, and here's where the tragedy begins for the Israelites. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishua, Saul's son. And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was so wounded of the archers. Now, it would seem that the beginning of the end of Saul, of course, is here. He's first hit in battle by an archer. Apparently, it was by someone who did not recognize that he had hit the king. It was a real, shall we say, a real bullseye, and he had hit the king. The tragedy that is here, of course, is that Jonathan is slain here in this battle. And this is remarkable because we read on one occasion that Jonathan slew 250 of the enemy, and they were Philistines at one time. So it reveals how hopelessly outnumbered Israel was now. And This could well have been a battle in which David and Jonathan would have been on opposite sides. God had intervened. My David felt badly that he couldn't go into the battle, you know. Well, he didn't recognize at the time that God had intervened on his behalf. And many times our disappointments are his appointments, as someone has neatly put it. All right, now we find here that this man Saul is wounded. What happens? Verse 4, Then said Saul unto his armor-bearer, Draw thy sword, and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armor-bearer would not. Now when Saul saw that he was mortally wounded, he felt that the enemy would come and get him and taunt him. And I think they would have. And also, he did not want to be slain like this in battle. Saul was a very, as we've seen, a very proud, egotistical man. And this was something that just wasn't becoming to him at all. Now we're told his armor bearer would not. He was afraid to do this, to lay hand upon the king. Therefore, Saul took a sword and fell upon it. Now it would look as if Saul was a suicide. Was he a suicide now? Well, we'll find out. When his armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor-bearer, and all his men that same day together. And when the men of Israel that were on the other side of the valley and they that were on the other side Jordan saw that the men of Israel fled, that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled, and the Philistines came and dwelt in them. And it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his three sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. They cut off his head, stripped off his armor, 
and sent into the land of the Philistines round about to publish it in the house of their idols and among the people. And you begin to see now, with this armor being sent around, of why Saul tried to get David to wear his armor out to fight Goliath. The whole point was that had David won with the armor of Saul, who would have taken credit for the battle? Well, we know. We know that Saul would have because when his own son got a victory, and instead of giving his son credit for it, he blew the trumpet in the land and he took credit for it. Now will you notice, they put his armor in the house of Ashtaroth, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. And when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard of that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night, took the body of Saul and the bodies of his son from the walls of Bethshan, and came to Jabesh and burnt them there. They took their bones and buried them under a tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. Now, we come actually now to the end of 1 Samuel. And somebody says, well, there wasn't such a mystery about the death of Saul. You seem to think there was quite a mystery. Well, we're not actually through with this yet. In 2 Samuel, we'll pick it up. But now we have the death of Saul recorded here at the end of 1 Samuel. And we now can come to some sort of conclusions. First of all, Saul failed in ruling God's property. And the end here is self-destruction as far as 1 Samuel is concerned. And God and his authority are rejected. And this is a dark day for the nation Israel. And isn't it interesting? We are going to find out that Saul spared the Amalekites and Samuel rebuked him for it and said, To obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. God wants obedience. And this man's heart was never bowed to Almighty God. And now we're going to find out Saul was actually killed by the Amalekites. Now, somebody says, but we've already had the record that the Philistines did it. An archer shot him, and he was mortally wounded. And he tried to get his armor bearer to kill him, and he would not. And he fell on his own sword. Isn't that the explanation? And this is a closed case, is it not, for the police department of Beth Shan? I don't think so. 